Okay, we're going to go ahead and get started. Uh, thank you for everybody for taking the time this morning to uh, attend the webinar on conducting a vendor search. My name is Scott Cameron. I am one of the principals of Multnomah Group and I oversee our, all of our research uh, investments and vendor research efforts and uh, will be presenting uh, today uh, on, on conducting a vendor search. Uh, before we get started, a few housekeeping items. Um, just to, to maintain sound quality, uh, we have put everybody on mute, um, so there's no background noise coming in during the webinar. Uh, if you do have questions, uh, feel free to use the uh, the questions panel uh, in the GoToWebinar uh, uh, panel to, to submit any questions, and, and we'll be sure to, to answer those um, either throughout the presentation or at the end. Uh, if you have uh, questions as a follow-up, you know, certainly feel free to reach out to myself or anybody else at Multnomah Group that you may uh, work with. Uh, and and we will get your questions answered. Uh, we are recording the webinar. Uh, we will post that to our website uh, for anybody that may be interested in, in re-watching this or if you're interested in sharing it with any of your colleagues uh, and following up on the meeting, we'll be sending out a copy of the slide deck as well to everybody that registered for the presentation. Before we get started, um, just a quick overview of, of the agenda. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about the benefits of conducting a vendor search, uh, the frequency and timing that we see commonly used in, in, in vendor searches, uh, what types of criteria you may be using as, as we go through this to assess vendors, uh, and then some best practices and a few case studies that show, uh, I think, some of the differences that, that may result from uh, uh, conducting a search and how it may fit different objectives. So there, there are multiple benefits to conducting a, a vendor search for a new record keeping vendor for your retirement plan. Uh, and, and primary to that is uh, helping uh, plan fiduciaries satisfy certain responsibilities that they have uh, to monitor and evaluate the service providers uh, that they're using in their plan to ensure that the fees that they're paying for the services that they're receiving are, are reasonable. Uh, and um, to also ensure that um, you're uh, providing the right levels of, of information to your participants. Uh, well, I think there's a number of, of fiduciary uh, benefits to conducting a vendor search with some regularity. I think there's also other um, uh, operational uh, benefits to plan sponsors uh, that at times can can be as impactful or maybe even more impactful uh, than the than the fiduciary uh, responsibilities that we're looking at. Um, Areas where we see kind of improvements that come because of conducting a vendor search uh, for plan operations include the ability to uh, delegate or outsource uh, certain administrative uh, responsibilities that have maybe been uh, handled internally, uh, making you more efficient. Um, and uh, also the ability to um, you know, outsource some uh, some fiduciary responsibility. Uh, and we'll talk a little bit about um, the outsourcing aspect uh, of uh, kind of what can be achieved with vendor searches as we go through some of the case studies later on. In addition to helping fulfill uh, the fiduciary requirements uh, that you have as a plan sponsor in evaluating and, and determining reasonableness of the service providers uh, and potentially improving uh, internal operations by outsourcing, uh, conducting a vendor search with uh, some regularity also can improve plan service levels, uh, improving uh, plan metrics, things like plan utilization, employee satisfaction, uh, because the, the outcome of conducting the search can actually uh, result in improved um, technology and service uh, tools. And that's true whether you end up making changes to your record keeper or not. Uh, what we frequently find is that uh, the record keeping market is a pretty dynamic uh, and competitive market and, and the record keepers that, that are serving uh, plant sponsors are, are frequently rolling out new tools, new technologies, new service offerings and capabilities all the time. Because they're focused on kind of uh, top line growth most frequently, what we're seeing though is that they're using those new capabilities that they're developing primarily and new business opportunities. So if they offer a new service, um, you know, that's something that they're going to take out and try and sell to uh, their prospective clients and, and use that as a, as a lever to try and gain new business. They're typically 
not as focused on rolling those out to existing clients uh, who could appear to be content with kind of the service offering now. So um, by doing a periodic vendor search, even if it doesn't result in uh, a change to your record keeper, it can bring to the forefront new capabilities that your existing vendor has that can improve the plan uh, and the service levels that you're receiving. It also certainly provides notice to uh, the record keeper that you're you're diligently monitoring this and that they need to continue to provide the highest level of service and the most competitive uh, fees because you're you're actively looking so uh, you know there frequently we find as we talk to plan sponsors you know the idea of a vendor search comes up primarily when they get to a point of dissatisfaction with the incumbent vendor and are looking to actively make a change um, as we'll talk about you'll see I think even though you know I think that's a great time to do a vendor search there can be some other benefits that come by doing a vendor search when everything is generally fine uh, to, to just benchmark and, and get a lay of where the market is uh, not necessarily with the intent to change your record keeper, but to just make sure that you're getting the kind of full advantage of all the capabilities that they have. So one of the questions we frequently get is, you know, how how often should we do a vendor search? And there's no bright line requirement. So as I mentioned, I think most often what we see is vendor searches are done when there's a point of pain that's causing a plan sponsor to, to evaluate that relationship and say I need to make a change this isn't working um, beyond that we have seen uh, some industry sources kind of recommend every three to five years uh, plan sponsors should be conducting vendor searches and we've started to see some plaintiffs attorneys and some of the ERISA litigation out there claim that if you're not conducting a search with every three or five years you're not fulfilling your fiduciary duties nothing has certainly come of that that has, has set an industry standard and I think if you're actively evaluating and benchmarking your plan providers there's you know kind of no bright line that every three years or every five years we have to go through this process uh, but I would say uh, while that that bright line doesn't exist uh, the market is pretty dynamic and there are changes that uh, do occur uh, over a three to five year cycle that may uh, warrant you conducting a search I, you know I think the challenge for clients that don't stick to a cycle of you know maybe every five years is that there's a tendency kind of to, to put it off indefinitely and, and to never conduct a search. And, and we do find with some uh, regularity that there are plan sponsors that have not um, done a, uh, a record keeping search in, in over a decade. Uh, and in some cases in, in the tax exempt markets have never done a search at all uh, with any type of fiduciary process, you know, and their, their relationships with their record keepers just date back 20, 30, 40, 50 years uh, and it's it's just kind of been the status quo is what's gone forward as I mentioned um, you know while I think there's benefits from from gauging where the market is every uh, three to five years you know I think still the the primary uh, reason we see vendor searches is that plan sponsors are dissatisfied um, either with uh, pricing uh, although pricing frequently can be fixed without going through a full search if you're working with somebody that's kind of knowledgeable on where the pricing in the market is uh, or more frequently with with service levels uh, and we'll talk about you know how we've we've um, addressed some of that with a, a few searches that we've done in the in the case studies that we talk about and I think one of the things that's important uh, is, is you contemplate conducting a vendor search is uh, coordinating that that search process and, and what potentially could be an implementation timeline with the other activities that are going on uh, within the plan and within your organization. Um, things like open enrollment, entry dates, plan year end, any work you're doing on plan document design and review. Uh, frequently we, we work with clients where the, the kind of the day-to-day -day administration of the plan is owned by a benefits group or HR group uh, and trying to uh, you know tackle a project as large as a vendor search when you're going through open enrollment or evaluating healthcare options or trying to implement a new um, 
uh, HR software system you know, can be pretty challenging. So I think one of the things is, and we'll talk about the process and, and kind of what a, a timeline might look like, but I think it's important both kind of internal uh, for the folks that are going to be actively involved in the search to understand what their level of time commitment is and, and what will be expected of them through this process uh, and how that impacts the other projects they may be working on as well as if you do make changes the, the potential communication timeline and how it may impact your participants uh, and um, other things that you're communicating to them. Um, we have seen uh, cases where you know an employer was making some significant changes to their health care program uh, that uh, were in some regards shifting cost to uh, their employees and I think creating some um, you know some mild dissatisfaction uh, among the employee population trying to make changes to the retirement plan that uh, at the same time, uh, if not communicated properly, um, you know, can actually uh, cause that process to to be more more painful than it than it should be. So just understanding timing. A um, couple other things from kind of an external timing that we do see pop up. Um, you know, one is historically there's been a thought uh, that we should make changes uh, around planned year end which for most plans is uh, calendar year end. Um, that's becoming less popular uh, the final few weeks of uh, December and early January um, can be a difficult time to, to try and do communication with employees uh, about changes. You, know, you also see you know, more frequently that, that staffing levels kind of fall off uh, as people take paid time off and are out of the office. Um, so we are seeing more uh, plans do kind of mid-year transitions. Those mid-year transitions can potentially increase for the, the year of transi transition, the time it takes uh, to pull together uh, data uh, for uh, testing and, and 5500 protection. Uh, production uh, as well as the audit, uh, but typically I would say the the benefits of of not trying to cram in uh, a search or a, a vendor change at calendar year end outweigh the the pain of, of kind of a mid year transition. It certainly has gotten easier as as kind of technology is approved uh, from a record keeping perspective. But something to keep an eye on is is kind of when through the calendar year you may want to be making changes. I do think it makes sense to, to make changes around a quarter end or the first day of a calendar quarter uh, that tends to, to, to fit rather than doing mid-month or mid-year, or I'm sorry, mid-quarter, mid mid-month uh, transitions. We'll talk a little bit more about the, the search timeline. I would say uh, as you think about this process, if you're, if you're contemplating making a, a change, um, I would plan at least six months for the search and implementation process. Uh, so if your goal is uh, to make a change effective a certain date, you need to really back up at least six months uh, to um, get that process started. Uh, so as an example now, if we were, were starting a vendor search process, you know, not likely to be encouraging clients to be targeting a, a conversion date any sooner than July 1st of 2018. Uh, and a lot of the timeline is dependent on, on your availability and the time you can spend on this. Uh, certainly we've seen projects go longer than six months. Um, and, and I think if there's a good project plan, it could be spread out and ease the, the burden a little bit from a time perspective uh, longer than that. It's pretty hard to do anything uh, in a shorter time period than six months um, and, and do it effectively. So as we talk about the, the search process, you know, one of the things that, that I think is important to understand is how we evaluate record keeping vendors. Uh, and there's a number of criteria that, that I think we'll talk about. Um, uh, and they can have different weightings depending on the specific needs of your plan and the objectives that you've set out. And, and we can talk a little bit about that again with the case studies. Um, you know, certainly I think reputation in the marketplace is, is an important kind of critical factor, both um, the reputation of uh, the firm with respect to uh, the plant sponsor community, uh, but also with respect to um, your plant participants. Uh, if your um, 
trying to make changes uh, in record keeping and communicate the positive benefits that come of that uh, to your employees. If you're working with a vendor that has um, a negative reputation uh, with participants, I think that can be challenging. Um, I've certainly seen that um, here recently with respect to uh, Wells Fargo uh, as a financial institution. It's been in the headlines because of uh, some of their their activities. You know, there is a uh, well, none of that really impacted their uh, corporate retirement plan business. Uh, there is kind of a halo effect on their brand that I think um, has hurt the reputation there. Uh, and there are other examples of that uh, quite frequently that, that can pop up, uh, both negative or uh, you know also potentially positive, uh, that may make it easier to um, you know communicate uh, those changes and uh, to your participant population. Um, experience, I think, is, a, is another critical factor to evaluate, uh, both experience broadly uh, in the business, but more specifically, uh, experience with uh, the specific types of plans uh, that you may be sponsoring, your industry, your plan type, or uh, plan features. Um, you know, common um, types of, of experience that we're looking at uh, or, or kind of niche uh, experience that we're looking at could be uh, in servicing tax-exempt institutions versus 401k or corporate clients. Uh, we just conducted a search where an employer had uh, privately held employer stock. Um, you know, a lot of firms say they have the capability of doing uh, that type of work within the plan, uh, but looking to see that they've actually done that and have experience doing that, I think, is a different uh, different uh, component uh, to look at from a, a, an experience level. Um, you know, what, if it's not plan design or specific plan features, industry uh, is another common uh, kind of niche that that you would be looking at to define uh, whether the 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 vendors that you're you're soliciting proposals from have experience with that. Um, you know, there are differences uh, in how vendors uh, communicate and interact with employees uh, based on industry and employee type. If it's a you know large professional services company uh, that everybody is uh, kind of at their desk and and uh, logging into the website all the time, the types of technology that you can use and the communication capabilities and, and the methods there are different than if you're working with a, uh, or if you're a retail client and, and people are in stores spread out across the country and um, you know, don't have ready access to um, a computer. So there are differences based on industry and employee type as well that I think are worth um, trying to drill in and, and evaluate a vendor's experience specifically with that type of client rather than just broad industry experience. Beyond experience, trying to gauge current and former client satisfaction levels. Um, you know, this is a, a challenge because there's not a lot of standards uh, as it relates to public data around this. Uh, we uh, see frequently that um, you ask for data around uh, retention levels um, and look at some of the public surveying data. Um, those tend to be not great evaluation tools. Um, there's not, you know, each vendor kind of calculates client retention differently. Um, and so, you know, it's if everybody reports great retention, it's kind of not meaningful in any way. If they struggle to come up with uh, high retention numbers in the mid-90s or higher, uh, that can be a red flag because, I mean, there, there's ways that they can kind of monkey with those numbers to make things look good, but if if they're reporting positive, it, it's kind of not a data point that we look at with um, any high weight in the evaluation. Similarly, a lot of the industry surveys um, are dependent on record keepers encouraging uh, their plan sponsors to uh, evaluate them and submit uh, their response. So, you know, to the extent that they're winning awards and, and some satisfaction survey uh, data, it's also something that is, is difficult to, to, to rely on. Um, so it's more of a negative uh, screen if, if you're not seeing that stuff, that, that, that may be a red flag. Um, you know, another kind of common method of evaluating uh, satisfaction levels is based on, on experience. Um, you know, frequently, uh, you as a plan sponsor may have employees that have worked with 
some of the organizations in, in prior positions, uh, or you may be working with a consultant that, that has um, experience and can speak for their client base um, uh, to, to speak uh, about um, the experience that their other clients had with those record keepers. So we look at service model, um, you know, this can, can kind of take different forms, uh, but one kind of common method that we look at is, um, you know, the, the kind of the relationship structure uh, for the people that you're going to be working with. Are you going to be working with um, a single relationship manager? Are they putting together a team where there's more specialized structure? If there is a team, um, how do you interact with them? Do you communicate through one person and they coordinate? Are you communicating with all of them? It's an area where there's not necessarily a good or bad, uh, but we certainly want to understand the service model that the client has, or I'm sorry, that the record keeper has, and whether that fits your needs. Uh, some people uh, like, um, you know, the accessibility of, of just calling in and, and speaking with whoever's available at the time and, and know that they can handle it. Uh, other plan sponsors, you know, much prefer the benefits of having a single uh, relationship manager that knows their plan more intimately, even though that person may be serving other clients and, and not as readily accessible if they're, they're traveling or meeting with clients. So understanding the service model, I think, is important uh, to evaluating a vendor. Uh, participant education and enrollment support, uh, certainly an area where we see a lot of vendors trying to uh, differentiate themselves, understanding the education and communication capabilities, how they support uh, you as a plan sponsor and enrolling your participants and then provide ongoing uh, communication education to the participants to try and improve uh, the utilization of the plan and, and the effectiveness of the plan. Um, looking at the, the quality of the annual plan review, um, whether they are being proactive and pushing out information and analytics, and I think an area that we're seeing a lot of um, growth in that I think is positive is that um, plants uh, record keepers are are better mining the wealth of, of plan demographic data that they have to uh, communicate to the plan sponsor areas of potential improvement and to also put in place targeted programs to improve uh, participation and savings and investing activities for, for different segments of the, the plan population. Uh, but ideally what we're looking for is, is record keepers that are, are proactive in that approach, that are, are able to um, uh, kind of push ideas to the plan sponsor, but also able to meet any specific needs that you may have and how you look at your business uh, and want to tackle uh, the, the plan review. Going along in a lot of cases with um, the participant education communication evaluation is looking at some of the, the primary tools that, that you're looking at web, uh, both for the plan sponsor and how they interact with uh, the record keeper through the, the plan sponsor portal or, or website, uh, as well as the participant website and experience. Um, this is another area where we're seeing a fair amount of, of, of development going on in the marketplace and, and where if you haven't done a search in a few years, you may see some differences uh, primarily around the mobile experience as that becomes more of a primary means for many plan sponsors, or I'm sorry, for many participants to interact with their financial accounts. We're seeing greater development of, of mobile and, and um, app-based technologies uh, to interact and, and greater functionality in that regards. You know, there's a lot of focuses in our experiences as we go through th these vendor searches on the participant experience um, and to a lesser degree frequently on, on the plan sponsor experience. And, and one of the challenges is, um, you know, trying to evaluate when you go through a search um, when everybody says we provide great service. Um, one area that we're seeing um, more focus from a, a search perspective on is trying to articulate service standards around the timing of certain activities, uh, processing contributions, distributions, loans, uh, providing statements, uh, providing uh, testing results, um, 5500 prep, audit support, those types of things, and, and having vendors better articulate uh, the timing standards of those and the, the, the quality of those um, experiences. Uh, and uh, coupling with that, 
you know, asking for more explicit guarantees as it relates to uh, fees uh, if those standards aren't met. So more and more uh, vendors are being asked to put some of their fees at risk if they're unable to meet their service standards. Uh, certainly an area of focus, um, especially as the fee uh, commitment grows for, for larger plans, uh, is to try and put in place some very specific guarantees around service standards um, so that you can hold the vendor accountable if, if there, are, there are issues with the, the timeliness or quality of their work. Conversion process, um, something that's important, depends on where you're coming from, I, 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 would, I would say. Um, if you're coming from a complicated scenario, um, you know, understanding a vendor's capabilities and doing the, the conversion out of that vendor and into their system is important, as well as the timeline and the service model with respect to this. Most vendors, I think we're seeing as a best practice, and we'll talk a little bit about this as we look at the conversion process or, or putting in place a dedicated project manager and holding weekly project calls. Uh, but it can be an issue if, if the vendor is inexperienced in doing conversions that it can lead to some, some bad outcomes. Um, we recently did a, uh, a vendor search for a 403B uh, plan with a, it was a hospital that had two incumbent vendors. One was an annuity provider uh, that had liquidity restrictions on existing uh, annuity assets uh, and um, that vendor that they had uh, as the incumbent uh, was also uh, getting out of the business. So, um, you know, it was really important uh, as we did that search process to evaluate kind of the ability of, of any new provider selected to, to navigate the complexities of the annuity contracts that were in place uh, and work with the vendor who, because they were getting out of the business, were not, not heavily resourced from a staffing perspective and, and to make that go seamless with clients. Fees, certainly uh, an important uh, measure. Uh, as we look at fees, and, and we'll talk a little bit about this as, as we talk uh, about some of the objectives that, that we see frequently are articulated, really we're looking at kind of all-in plan fees um, as it relates to record-keeping administration. Um, one of the things that certainly become kind of industry standard is, is an expectation of open architecture from an investment perspective. And as we do uh, vendor search projects, we're certainly requiring that, that plans, uh, record keepers uh, that are responding to those are not responding uh, with the assumption that they're using proprietary investment products or other uh, investment products uh, that may subsidize the record keeping. So trying to look at that. And, and I think the biggest key in, in looking at that is making sure that uh, we're able to get to an apples to apples comparison uh, so that we have consistency in, in the services that we're, we're asking from vendors and the price for those services. With that though, you know, we're also very um, cautious in um, how fees are approached in the vendor search and, and I think the challenge that we find with with looking at fees is because it is the easiest thing to quantify that frequently it becomes a greater um, metric or, or weight of the criteria than it may uh, have been intended because you can look and say well this vendor is, is X basis points and this one is Y basis points, everything else is a little bit softer in terms of quality of the service and the participant communications and service standards and all that. You know, it tends to be that there are cases where there becomes an over-reliance on, on, on fees uh, because it's so easily quantifiable. So that's something to also keep in mind as, as you go through this process. In addition to the, the level of fees, you know, I think the other thing that's I think is important in looking at fees is, is the vendor's disclosure philosophy and how they are uh, treating revenue sharing if there is any in the investment level and just the general transparency of their pricing model. Uh, because you know, what's going to happen is that as the plan changes, it grows, or the market changes, you know, fees will change over time. Um, and so, while well, it's important to understand what the, the fees are today and how that projects out, more important, I think, in some regards is understanding what transparency the vendor will provide in, to the fees uh, as the market changes and you try and renegotiate new pricing uh, and um, additional services in the future. So understanding their, their approach uh, to transparency of fee disclosures, revenue sharing, 
practices, those types of things are, are important. And then lastly, uh, any investment restrictions or limitations. Again, we, we start with the mindset of assuming open architecture and uh, if you are putting limitations in place, um, trying to understand those rather than assuming that we're going to use all proprietary funds and, and then may want to to deviate from that, we start with the assumption that you know, the, the platform is open and unlimited and, and you need, if you're responding to a proposal, to communicate any limitations that you may have um, because that's um, certainly something to, to take into consideration as you look at vendors. In terms of the, the search steps, um, Step one is to form a, a vendor search committee. Uh, in some cases, this could be the retirement plan committee. Uh, if, if one is established, it could be a subset of the retirement plan committee, uh, or it could be a, you know, a combination of folks that are on the retirement plan committee plus uh, people that maybe aren't on the committee but are actively involved in the day-to-day -day management of the plan. It kind of depends on your approach, but I do think it's important to have a, a group that has clear authority uh, to make a decision with respect to the vendor uh, if they're going to make a change, uh, but also has um, the perspective of some of the primary constituencies, so uh, some sort of executive leadership uh, to, to get the buy-in, but also in the involvement of, of folks that are going to deal with the vendor on a day-to-day -day basis, either um, from the HR group that is responsible for things like uh, enrolling new participants, submitting payroll, uh, coordinating census data uh, or f potentially in the finance group that's responsible for things like audit and, and others. Um, depending on your culture, um, you can, you may choose to bring in um, uh, some kind of employees that aren't actively involved in the retirement plan uh, to solicit feedback either as part of the vendor search committee or potentially, uh, and we'll talk a little bit about this and where this may fit in the timeline, uh, you can solicit some of that feedback uh, either by, by doing some employee surveying uh, or uh, focus groups or, or uh, open forums through the process if, if that's culturally important to, to to receive employee feedback about uh, vendor decisions. Once you've formed the group that's going to be responsible for this process, uh, the first thing is to develop and manage a search schedule. Um, setting a deadline for each step in the process, um, I would I typically recommend that clients uh, work backwards, so figure out when the ideal time is to uh, potentially implement a new vendor, and then let's work backwards uh, in building out the timeline for each of the major steps, uh, allowing, as I had mentioned before, at least six months uh, to complete that project and potentially longer than that. Um, and the longer than that, uh, we can talk about where we see um, kind of the greatest uh, areas where the timing of, uh, of that project could flex. Uh, but in some cases, it could be an eight, nine, even 12-month process uh, to conduct uh, the search. Once the timeline's been set, uh, the next thing is to define the scope of the search and, and the objectives. Um, I think it's important to, to narrow the scope as much as possible and, and have a clear understanding of what it is you're trying to accomplish. Uh, in some cases, um, if you're just trying to gauge where the market is, you may narrow the scope by limiting the number of uh, vendors that you're going to submit this uh, RFP to. Uh, in some cases, you may narrow the scope by focusing more just on pricing as kind of a first level uh, evaluation before diving into to services. Um, but I think it's important to uh, have a clear uh, and, and relatively narrow scope uh, that, that you're trying to accomplish to maintain the efficiency and to, to limit the, the likelihood that this project will uh, get out of hand uh, and become kind of burdensome to use the plan sponsor. In addition to narrowing the scope, I think it's also important to define the objectives uh, at the outset uh, because there can be a tendency for, uh, as you go through the process, um, if, if objectives have not been defined clearly, uh, for those to change based on, on kind of the interactions and the responses from uh, the, the, the vendors that you're submitting proposals to. So if, if the primary objective is, is you've had some administrative errors with your plan, you know, it's clear to 
it's best to clearly articulate that at the outset and keep that in mind as you go through the whole process evaluating vendors against that rather than um, uh, allowing uh, some of the vendor strengths to kind of change kind of what you're looking for so you know a lot of times we'll see you know, vendors come with new programs and kind of fancy tools and things that can um, seem interesting uh, and if not disciplined as a, as a search committee and, and as a consultant, it can those things can become primary in, in the evaluation and decision making uh, when that wasn't really what the, the objective was at the outset. So making sure that you define those objectives and, and, and staying consistent with that is, is important. If you're trying to kind of articulate what those objectives are, this is an opportunity um, uh, to potentially form some participant focus groups or do some employee surveying uh, to gather feedback. Um, I would say in most cases it doesn't make a ton of sense to have uh, your employee population kind of actively involved throughout the search. They just don't have the context of, of some of the things that you're going to be evaluating in, in the decisions uh, and, and the priorities. But if, if it's important culturally that you gather and solicit feedback, you know, I think that's best done before stating the search objectives and, and that can be done as I mentioned through uh, putting together a brief employee survey to solicit feedback, uh, hosting some focus groups for those participants that are interested in providing feedback uh, or doing any, uh, an open forum type discussion where you can talk about kind of the project and why you're doing it and, and what uh, gather feedback about what may be important to your employees during that process. Once the, uh, the search objectives and the, the scope has been defined, uh, pre-qualifying the vendors that you're going to solicit proposals from. Um, again, I don't think most cases you want to solicit, solicit uh, proposals from everybody in the marketplace. That's a lot of proposals. Um, so trying to find either by working with um, a consultant partner or um, just internally with uh, the folks tasked with this and who the best set of vendors uh, to send this to um, and, and putting together a list there so that you can be sure to solicit those proposals uh, uh, from those vendors um, uh, when you distribute the RFP um, is, is the next step. Once you kind of have the vendor list that you're going to submit it to, um, then you're going to put together uh, the request for proposal uh, questionnaire. Um, there's you know, a few different things to look at as you put together uh, an RFP. Um, you know, I think there are there are many kind of industry standard questions that that can go into that. And um, you know, certainly, if you're working with a consulting firm, they have a lot of experience or, or should have a lot of experience. It's, it's kind of a, a baseline template of, of RFP questions to ask. And it's important in terms of doing your due diligence that you ask some of those. Uh, but one of the things I think is really important is that while you don't just rely on kind of the industry standards questionnaires, whether it's provided by the uh, consultant or uh, there's a group out there called the Spark Institute that publishes kind of a template RFP, um, but that you develop some some very custom questions about your specific engagement. So if um, you have objectives uh, around one certain area, be sure to include questions that, that very specifically articulate um, how a vendor is going to meet those objectives because you know a lot of the industry standard questions um, end up with kind of industry standard responses rather than um, uh, responses that are tailored very specifically your, for your plan, for your engagement, and, and the issues that you have there. Once the uh, request for proposal has been drafted and you have your vendor list, um, it's time to distribute that uh, to the vendor universe um, and uh, uh, solicit those responses. I think it's uh, as you do this and, and build the timeline for this step of the process, it's important to give the vendors enough time to uh, put together a, a good response. So I would say that you know, the, the 
request for proposals should be out with the vendors for at least a few weeks. Um, I wouldn't give them too long uh, because people tend to procrastinate, but a few weeks to coordinate resources. Uh, we also frequently in, in that process include an ability uh, in a structured way to so, uh, ask uh, follow-up questions uh, that the vendors may have about the proposal and to uh, kind of distribute a response to those follow-up questions to all vendors. So uh, as we do search is uh, what that looks like is there's a kind of an interim deadline to submit any questions that the vendors may have to us. Uh, we'll gather those and we'll put together um, an FAQ document with the questions and the responses that we then distribute as a follow-up to all the vendors so that everybody has the same uh, kind of level playing field in terms of information about the plan. The other thing I would mention, I, I kind of skipped over this, is as you look at the request for proposal, um, it's important as you put that together uh, to not focus just on uh, the questions that you're asking of the vendor, but also to provide context for the vendor about your plan. So um, demographic information, number of employees, number of active participants, number of terminated participants, assets by fund, any liquidity constraints that you may have, um, loan activity, payroll activity, uh, education, uh, current education um, uh, program, and you know, is it done on-site, is it done online, if it's on-site, where are the locations, how frequently is it done? The more information that you can provide vendors uh, in soliciting a proposal, I think the better the responses you are going to get. Once you get back the responses, um, you know, it's important to, to assess uh, the, uh, the proposals. And, um, you know, this is certainly an area that is, is um, consultants we spend a lot of time on uh, getting back these responses. They typically can be 70 to 100 pages of written questions and answers about um, the, the capabilities of a vendor plus a few hundred pages of supplemental materials. Uh, so the, the, the materials that come back are, are pretty uh, daunting, I guess, to, to analyze, but it's important that, you, that those get read uh, and that there's a standard kind of methodology to assess each proposal and make sure that each vendor is evaluated on a consistent basis, um, both for the, the service aspects of that as well as for the pricing aspects as we talked about. Once the analysis has been done, uh, the committee uh, should meet uh, and evaluate those uh, and uh, based on that evaluation, uh, select finalists uh, that they want to interview in person. Uh, most commonly we see that uh, three finalists are chosen, uh, but in some cases it could be more than that depending on um, you know, how close the responses were and, and some of the incumbent activity in, in other situations, but three is a pretty common number. Uh, then we coordinate the finalist presentations. Um, uh, usually they're an hour to 90 minutes for each vendor. I think it makes sense to have them on the same day or back to back so that all the information is fresh in your mind. Uh, it's important, I think, as you bring in vendors for finalist presentation that they're provided a very structured agenda of what it is that you want them to address and accomplish during that. Uh, if uh, that that structure is not there, uh, a lot of times you'll get a, a sales presentation that doesn't really um, add a great deal of value in your uh, in terms of your evaluation of them. So trying to be very structured and, and communicate proactively what you're hoping they accomplish during a finals presentation is important. At that stage, um, you know, it's also important, I think, uh, to review, uh, request and review any sample service agreements, plan documents, participant notices, uh, and some of the other materials that are important in that. Um, you know, service agreements, I think, is an area that's of particular importance in, in getting, uh, in some cases, uh, your legal group involved that may not be involved in the vendor search to, to start reviewing service agreements to understand if, if you make a selection with one specific vendor, if there are any um, uh, any issues that may pop up or need to be negotiated before that's finalized. And then once the, the finalist presentations are done, I think requesting uh, vendor references and, and checking those references um, at that stage is, uh, is important. Um, again, that's another area where I think it makes sense to have a lot of structure to that and have very specific questions that you want to ask of those vendors uh, and also ask um, the, the vendors uh, 
for both current clients as well as former clients to speak with. Um, I think too often uh, reference checks end up being of limited value when you just uh, speak with somebody and say, you know, are you happy? And they say, yeah, things are fine. Uh, having a, a prepared list of questions to, to address with them, I think, makes those of greater value. Of value. And then uh, once you've selected a vendor, assuming the references are check out, uh, starting to negotiate uh, preliminary fees and service standards with all finalists, what we'll typically find is while we ask about service uh, guarantees and service standards, uh, most record keepers are able to articulate service standards, uh, but are a little bit um, lacking in specificity as to the uh, the fees at risk and the guarantees that they'll provide until you're farther in the process. So at this point is the time to lock down uh, those service guarantees and, and the fees that they're willing to put at risk. Usually they'll put some, some pretty broad parameters around that in the RFP response, but say we're happy to negotiate and, and you know figure those things out, and this is the time to do that. Once that's done, um, you know you select uh, the new vendor and you kind of move on to the the conversion timeline and and the next steps in that process. A few best practices to call out uh, along the way. Um, you know it's important to document the the search process, the steps that you're conducting. Uh, really, this relates back to you know one of the primary objectives of doing the vendor search is to be able to to demonstrate that you're fulfilling your fiduciary responsibilities, uh, having kind of clear documentation through this process of, of the activities that you've done and the decisions you've made I think is important. A couple of er other areas um, uh, best practice to consider. Uh, one is reviewing the plan design uh, prior to, to starting this. Uh, if you're using a vendor provided plan document, um, you know, it's important to understand what if any challenges uh, changing vendors may present to you. So if you understand what kind of non-standard um, uh, features are in your plan document, you can make a decision of whether that's a, a priority that the new vendor needs to be able to, to support or if there's flexibility in, in your mind as to whether you can make changes to fit into a new vendor's plan document template. Knowing that beforehand I think is important. You know, another consideration is also potentially conducting a, a fiduciary assessment before beginning the search process. Um, if you don't have a good handle on, on kind of the, all the activities with respect to your plan, the fiduciary assessment can highlight some of the, the challenges and things that you may want to address through the search process. You know, if you have an, kind of an active retirement plan committee that's been managing the plan for some time, uh, that's not necessary, but a lot of times we find it, it's a beginning step for somebody that hasn't evaluated their vendor and hasn't been kind of actively fulfilling their fiduciary responsibilities for, for a while. And then lastly, you know, I, I do think that um, you know it, it, it can make sense either working with your existing consultant or if you don't work with an existing consultant, engaging a consultant on a project basis to assist in managing the process. Uh, both, I think, because uh, a good uh, experienced search consultant can bring a lot of, of industry knowledge and experience to the process. Uh, but they can also, um, you know, take on a lot of the responsibilities of uh, the vendor evaluation and vendor coordination and contacting that I think can can make this a, a pretty significant process if you try and handle it internally. Um, you know, one of the things that we we see quite frequently is as soon as you issue the document to uh, a vendor, uh, the salespeople want to you know try and get on your calendar. You're managing that. You're answering questions. They'll take as much time as you're willing to give them. Uh, and once you get the proposals back, you know, trying to get through that material and understand what they're they're talking about, and, and try and put together an assessment of that can be a pretty significant uh, investment of your time. And that's an area where I think a consultant can can help you uh, kind of streamline that process and, and take on some of those responsibilities. Well, the focus on this wasn't necessarily on kind of the implementation phase as much as on the, the search process. I think keeping in mind that there potentially is a conversion process at the end is important. And so a few tips with respect to this. Uh, one is, uh, you know, I mentioned that, you know, uh, six months is the timeline. Uh, and what we see is kind of some standard conversion processes. Uh, timelines, though, can vary from service provider to service provider. Uh, and the, the approach and process that they have can also vary. So during the search, I think it's important to ask for a sample uh, based on your deadlines and, and targeted implementation date 
a sample project timeline for the conversion as well as what that process looks like. Uh, usually takes 60 to 90 days. Uh, 60 is, is pretty aggressive from a timing perspective. 90 uh, is, is pretty standard. And in some cases, we can ex see that extended out to 120 days or even longer. Uh, depends on, on kind of the quality of the incumbent, uh, as well as how much and uh, in, in how you want to communicate these changes um, to participants uh, before making a change. Another tip uh, as it relates to the, the conversion is ensuring a prompt notification to the prior vendor. Um, it's really important that the prior vendor cooperate. A lot of times we see plan sponsors that are reluctant to, to notify the incumbent uh, until the last, uh, you know, they want to wait till the last possible minute because they're concerned about the quality of the service they're going to get. Um, the incumbents have deconversion processes and their own timelines that they're going to work with. If you wait too long, that can, that can mess up your timeline and there's not a lot of leverage you have uh, to, to, to alter that. Uh, so I think it's important to let them know up front um, and uh, be clear uh, so that they can provide uh, support through that process. And they're certainly not wanting to lose the business, but you know, they tend to be pretty professional and um, respectful of that process, but it's important to notify them uh, at the outset. During the conversion process, um, I think I mentioned, uh, you know, we think a best practice is kind of weekly uh, calls with the, the conversion team and, and the staff at your organization and the consultant potentially if you're working with one just to make sure that you're on track, that you understand what's expected of you uh, and that the vendor can uh, make sure that they're delivering on what's expected of them. Uh, those calls um, uh, frequently can be used to kind of troubleshoot the little issues that pop up in every conversion. There uh, tends to be hundreds of, of small little decisions that need to be made during the process that um, are, are decisions that you want to make. You don't want to have the vendor assume are being made, uh, but those um, those calls kind of keep you on track and allow you to, to, to coordinate and interact with them and make sure that you're you're making those decisions and, and understand the, the consequences and, and, and ramifications of that. Um, as part of those, uh, the implementation process, a, a participant communication education campaign I think is, is critical. Uh, it's an area during the RFP that we do ask information about how you communicate this, what's the timing of that, what's your, your process, um, but you know, having a clear um, uh, campaign of, of when and how you're going to communicate these changes to the participants is, is important. Uh, and also at the same time making sure as part of that campaign that, that the blackout notice is being provided in a timely basis and, and to the right group of people. And then uh, coordinating with the other ancillary vendors that, that may interact, uh, primarily with payroll. Um, you know, a lot of times as you make changes in vendors, it's an opportunity to potentially change uh, the type and, and uh, level of data that you're providing to the record keeper and there's some benefits from providing a kind of a greater data set to them than uh, some of the limited data that, that sometimes gets provided. So coordinating to make sure that the payroll file formats are, are match and are mapped to the right sources in the new record keeping system and that includes everything you want um, is, is important to keep in mind. A couple other things. Um, uh, as it relates to coordination of this, um, you know, coordinating internal controls and any operational requirements. As I mentioned, it's I think a good practice to have people that are involved in the plan, um, uh, involved in the search process, not necessarily from a decision-making perspective, but understanding how they interact with the existing vendor. Um, similarly, obtaining, uh, as you're going to be working with new website, new systems, uh, education and training for the staff that's working on that, making sure that they're set up with uh, the right levels of access and know how to use the new system. As it relates to employees, uh, you know, I think you know during the conversion process is going to be the time where you have the greatest um, attention level of the vendor uh, that you're working with. And so as you're going to be communicating a lot of changes to participants, it's also, also a good time to set goals around participation and um, uh, plan activities uh, to make sure that um, you have benchmarks that you can evaluate against 
And you know, this is another case where if you've done some focus groups, um, you know, being able to come back to that type of uh, setting and communicate some of the changes and how uh, the decision that you made reflects back uh, to the the input that you received can be helpful. Um, this is with any project, I think ensuring uh, that there's clarity on roles and responsibilities uh, is helpful. I think it's during this phase which you'll start to understand who you're going to work with at the record keeper, uh, what their role is, how you should communicate with them, also setting with them expectations at who within your organization they should be working with um, and um, how they should work with you. Um, you know, it is an opportunity uh, to outsource as much as possible uh, to them, uh, so I think it certainly makes sense and, and, and an area to keep in mind is, uh, you know, that through this conversion process, you're looking to try and push as much of the work as you want to them rather than have that stay with you, which maybe was a, a prior practice with the older record keeper. A few potential pitfalls uh, to avoid. Um, one, don't invite unqualified uh, vendors to the table. It's just a waste of time for you. Uh, doesn't add any value. Uh, once years ago, we did a search in a small town, and uh, anybody that ever called on uh, that plan sponsor um, uh, was invited to that. I think we had 29 uh, proposals to evaluate. Uh, multiple of them were kind of the different brokers bringing the same solution, uh, but you know, beyond the first. Eight, uh, there wasn't a lot of value added from all the additional work that was done. So uh, it's not worthwhile to, to just cast a wide net to cast a wide net. Bring in qualified vendors. Uh, I think if you evaluate between five and ten vendors, um, that's a pretty good uh, uh, set of, of, of responses to, to evaluate if they're if you've done the work to make sure they're qualified at the outset. As I mentioned before, uh, don't lose track uh, of your initial objectives. Um, Similar to that, you know, don't uh, make assumptions about uh, the services that a vendor is going to provide, either because that your incumbent does that or because it's something that you think that a, a new vendor should do. You know, ask a lot of questions. Uh, that's the best way to make sure there's no surprises. Uh, we spoke a little bit about this as we related to the investment menu, um, but don't make decisions based on fund lineups. Um, investment managers change, we replace managers over time because of a variety of different reasons. Instead, focus on the flexibility of the platform uh, and the ability to make changes and, and not have any uh, restrictions on that as you move forward. Um, don't overlook any uh, liquidity restrictions. Um, this is part of the notification uh, that I mentioned with the existing kind of incumbent vendor. If the existing investment options have any liquidity restrictions, it's important to understand that at the outset and also why it's important to notify that vendor so that you can get the clock started on some of those things that have a 12-month a put or a you know, certain number of, of months or years uh, before they can pay out. I mentioned uh, don't delay notifying the prior vendor. Um, also, don't keep participants in the dark. You know, I think it's helpful through the process that there's some communication, not at a, a very granular level, but um, as to why you're doing this um, and, and the benefits that will accrue to them. Just a few case studies here. Um, as we kind of run up on our hour, I'm not going to spend uh, really any time with them, uh, but certainly as we send out the materials, you can can look through at some of the objectives. You know, I think the one thing I would say um, is, you know, the benefits that come really come in, I think, three forms. Uh, one is improved uh, kind of outsourcing of services. Uh, second is improved uh, pricing. Um, and third is, um, you know, kind of uh, just kind of a changing nature of how you want to uh, interact with your plan. So in this case, we have a vendor that uh, was a 403B client that, that consolidated from multiple vendors to a single vendor. Uh, there were some uh, benefits in terms of how they interacted and what they were able to outsource. There's a separate case study that speaks to kind of an ability to improve the pricing structure uh, by conducting a vendor search and another one that was an ability to improve uh, the service levels. Um, with that, I, I want to be uh, uh, respectful of everybody's time, and I know we're coming up on the hour that we had committed uh, to. So I want to thank you again for uh, 
joining us today uh, to talk about this. Um, and as I mentioned, we'll send a follow-up with the slide deck. And um, if you have any questions uh, you know, now or, or at any point in the future, certainly uh, feel free to reach out to myself or uh, anybody else at the firm, and, and we'll be happy to answer those. Thank you, and with that, uh, we're going to end the presentation.